Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because we have somebody on the show today who is going to make You know, some things that are big and small seem more or less relevant. And that's why you actually need to listen in because I have David Wood on the show with me today. David, welcome. Thanks for having me on the show, Jim. David Wood was born and raised in Cessnock, Australia. His little sister died when he was seven years old. And a couple of years later, his brother was born. So he has a brother who's two years younger and his parents are still together. He shut down his emotions when his sister was killed and he witnessed her death. Apparently, he learned not to feel, and his family didn't feel, really, and they didn't talk about what had happened. So he grew up very left brain. He became top of his school and was just missing the rest of his soft skills. He was missing half of being human, and so for the last half of his life is about catching up and getting back into touch with his emotions, learning more about vulnerability, authenticity, influence, and true leadership. David Wood is a former consulting actuary to Fortune 100 companies, including Sony Music, Chanel, and Exxon. He was a professional entertainer for a year and a half, including performing on national television on the Australian version of The Gong Show. He left his cushy Park Avenue job more than 20 years ago to build the world's largest coaching business. And David became number one on Google for life coaching, serving an audience of 150,000 coaches and coaching thousands of hours of in 12 countries around the globe. He is the author of Name That Mouse because the elephant isn't the only animal in the room. David believes that tough conversations we avoid are our doorways to confidence, success, and love. And they become the defining moments that shape our world. David currently lives in Boulder, Colorado. He is single and happily divorced from a wonderful woman. David Wood, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I am, Jim. Let's do it. Man, I'm excited you're here. I mean, we've had some very good discussions before we started recording, uh, and I, I, I hope we bring that and more into this conversation. And I'm pretty confident of that because, you know, we, we talked about some things that I think for a lot of us, we don't necessarily pay attention to that we need to. Uh, and I think the title of the book, you know, gives us a gleaning into that. But, you know, we, we've heard about the elephant in the room, but really what is the mouse or mice Uh, in the room stand for yeah so we know about the elephant you see it i see it no one's saying anything right let's suppose i showed up to this podcast with blood on my face and i didn't say anything you you might be like what the hell is going on and viewers could be going what's going on um so we know about that but many creatures in the room are much more subtle they're not they're not they may be aren't as big as an elephant or Maybe it is big for me, but I don't know if you're even aware of it. Let's suppose I broke an agreement with with my wife. Uh, I'm not married right now, but let's suppose I I cheated 10 years ago or even kissed somebody at a bar and never said it. That might be a really big mouse for me, but it's not an elephant because I don't even know if she knows about it. So I felt like we needed a new animal in society, in our culture, in our vernacular, to point to both the subtle things that uh, maybe haven't made it to the size of an elephant or the things that are only in my world and you don't even know about it. And uh, it, it, let's let's use a subtle example, something quite small. Let's suppose um, you said something at a meeting last week and, and uh, I felt a bit shut down. I didn't really get to have my voice in the meeting and I, and I go back and complain to my partner about it. That's a mouse, right? It's not an elephant in the room because the other person doesn't even know about it and it might not be a really big thing for me. I'm just a little bit annoyed. That's a mouse. And when we can artfully name those mice and clue other people into our experience, we get much more deeply connected nine times out of ten 
and we have more influence over the other person and um and we even have more confidence because we're not hiding things. We're actually expressing ourselves in the world. Well, when you say that, I start thinking uh, of the different varieties of mouse and uh, or of mice. <laughs> and in the book, you know, you start talking about those. Um, so you talk about mouse varieties. So what do you mean by mouse varieties? Yeah, well, I'll give a few away here on this call and I won't give them all away. I still want people to get the book to to uh, to read about all of these mice. But one um, one classic example is a confession mouse. So, hey, I screwed up at work. I did this one thing. I didn't want to say anything because I might get in trouble, but I've decided I don't want that hanging over my head. I want to let you know it was me. I messed up. How can I make this right? Or Here's a here's a subtle confession, Mouse. I I missed a coaching call. I hate missing coaching calls with my clients because I want to be that rock that they can depend on. And last week I, I stepped away from my phone, so when the alarm went off for my coaching call, I missed it. I got there 15 minutes late. And then I saw a text message from my client, David, so sorry, I gotta miss this call. You know, let's reschedule. Now look, how tempting is it? to just say, thanks for letting me know, no problem, we'll reschedule, and not confess that I missed it too. Uh, I decided I wanted to share it because I didn't want her feeling bad about it, and I wanted to come clean and own up to the fact that I made a mistake as well. And so I, that's a confession mouse, and I, and I shared that. And I think she was very grateful because she'd been feeling so guilty about it and then hearing that I'd messed up too she's like oh okay it wasn't just me so there's a confession mouse then we might have um, an appreciation mouse people often think when they hear about this concept of mouse naming that it's just negative stuff no no uh, I I went I went to a rehearsal for a play that I've just gotten in. Uh, I have a role in Dracula and I'm very excited by this. The last play I did was when I was five years old. Now I'm doing a play and I'm doing Dracula. And as we're doing the table read, I was thinking that one guy in particular did such a good job. He did a better job than I did in the audition for that role. And so I said to him, man, I love what you're bringing to this role. Uh, feels really solid. I think you read better than I did, and I'm really looking forward to working off you. Now, that uh, he seemed to take that that really well. A lot of us would not share those appreciation mice. We might think, oh, you know, maybe it'll have them feel uncomfortable, or maybe they think I'm sucking up, or something like that. Also, there's a director of something else that I just joined. It's an improv troupe, and she's really good. And one night she said something that was a bit self-deprecating and I thought it's a little embarrassing for me to share with her how good I think she is, but let me take a shot and she'll do whatever she does with it. And I said, you know, you might be surprised at how good you are. Do you want to hear some of the things that I've been appreciating about you? And she said, well, yeah, of course I do. So I said this, 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 and I, I named the things and uh, she seemed to take it in. And so I'm glad I did that. So those are those are two different m mice. And a third one that I, I really love is a reality check mouse. So we have stories all the time and we don't even know that we have stories all the time. To us, it's just reality. This guy's a jerk. This person's really friendly. This person wants to help me. This person is never going to help me. We have these stories. And I'm not saying that none of them are true. A lot of them may be true, but we don't know. We make assumptions. So when we can catch it, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here. Um, let's suppose there's someone that twice when I've seen her at a party, she just seems kind of blank face and, uh, and I don't think she likes me. But I don't know if that's true. And so I could go up and say, hey, can I check something with you? I have a feeling like maybe I offended you because um, each time I've seen you, you just, you just didn't seem like you wanted to chat. So I've given you some space and I realize I may be completely hallucinating. It, it may be a complete fabrication that I've just made up and I want to check it with you. 
she can say whatever she wants. She might be like, she might not want to talk about it. Okay, that's fine. She might want to say, um, no, that's not true at all. I just thought you didn't like me or like, who knows? But that's a reality check mouse. So we can check out our stories and see if they're true or not. If it's true, we might be closer connected because we get to talk about it. If it's not true, we might get closer connected because we get to talk about it. So we win either way. Well, as you say that, I start thinking about us having a lot of blind mice, right? Um, you know, we talk about Ooh. the three blind mice, but I think we have a heck of a lot more than that. And oftentimes we do not use our reality check mouse and uh, for a multitude of different reasons. And, and I also start seeing because a lot of this is behavior driven that, you know, we start creating more blind mice. And then so now we're ma- blind mice breeders. And it's like, I have all these things about what I think about other people and I'm doing all this judgment stuff and, you know, it's eroding, you know, it's, you know, it'll actually these are become boat anchors and becomes an elephant. So how yes. have you been doing that? Yes. Well, let me double click on that first. It's, it reminds me of the matrix. We think, we all think that we're living in the world. That's the, that's the first assumption that's absolutely incorrect. We are not living in the world. We're each living in our own world, our own individual matrix. If you've ever seen the movie, The Matrix, I think it's amazing. We don't live like, oh, this is my matrix today and this is my version of reality. No, we think that we're in the same world that everyone else is. Not true. Now, some of this data that we, some of the assumptions we make are good. Like, if I touch this hot plate that's glowing red, I'll be burned. That's an assumption that we make based on our past experience. That's good. We don't have to touch every glowing hot plate to work out if it's hot, but it falls down when it comes to people. So because people are changeable and we make assumptions about them. And also I might be making an assumption about you based on something that happened to me 15 years ago with someone who looked like you. So how do we stop doing that? First, we've got to, We've got to try and catch, oh, wait a minute, maybe this is not reality. It's almost like trying to catch a lucid dream or catch a dream. How do you work out when you're in a dream that it's just a dream? You don't know that. It looks like reality. Some people use a clue like like they train themselves that whenever they see a light switch in a dream, that's a clue to go, wait a minute, am I dreaming right now? Yes, I am. Awesome. I get to do whatever I want. So similarly in life, we need some kind of a trigger. Now, one trigger could be, I'm not enjoying this interaction. That could be the trigger. Whenever you're not enjoying the interaction, ask yourself, wait a minute, am I assuming something right now about this? Maybe I've got a story. Um, Maybe I'm feeling defensive. And so something's going on. What am I assuming? Oh, you know what? I, I, I'm feeling attacked. That's a mouse. I'm wanting to defend myself. That's another mouse. Um, and so I might share those self-expression mice. We didn't talk about that one. But I just want, want you to know me right now. I notice I'm feeling defensive, feeling a little bit attacked. Can we slow it down? Because I want to work with you and I want to feel more connected with you. And then... Am I assuming something here? I'm assuming that I'm in trouble. I'm assuming that, that you know, that, uh, that you want me to, to do better in my job or something like that. Is that right? And then we can check out those, those reality check mice with somebody else and find out. Maybe my story is 100% true. Maybe I'm totally off base and they've got a di- completely different version of reality. Well, as you're talking about that, I start thinking about, okay, so, if, so maybe I become, you know, more mindful, I become uh, more proactive in, uh, you know, identifying and then in engaging and addressing these, you know, different mice. But, th- but then I, I start to also start saying, okay, we, we need to find some balance here because I don't also want to be perceived as a drama mouse, right? It's like every time you're coming to me with some of this stuff and it's just like, get over it. Right. So, I mean, how, how do you find that happy medium? Well, what's an example? Can you give me an example of um, of that? Well, uh, so an example would be is that some people and 
they are always judging and looking for those opportunities and then always trying to address and 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 conjure up or perceive things that just don't exist and aren't true. And oftentimes they have negative taint, you know, tainting to them, you know, meaning that, you know, somebody is doing this for their own, you know, personal preservation, for their own advancement, uh, for, you know, trying to get over, you know, this, trying to cover up a lie. And, and you start creating all these different scenarios. And so you start addressing all these, you know, and then how do you, how do you not fall into, you know what, you're just like, you know, so-and-so who is always, you know, picking on and, and doing something. I mean, okay. so it's, it's like, how do I find that middle ground there to where it's productive and then, you know, received in a light that is, you know, more uh, con that it, that it, that it actually, you know, will create more positive outcomes more so than, alarm being an alarmist great well i'm writing down three words here i'm writing down complainer i'm writing down alarmist and i'm writing down too sensitive so these are three things that i could be worried about if i'm going to start naming my experience you know and so now we're getting to why many of us would not name mice as a habit. I didn't learn how to do it as a kid. I'm Australian. We, you know, parents, they didn't say to me, David, how are you feeling about that? That wasn't a thing that we did. So I didn't even learn to identify what's going on with me. That's one reason I wouldn't share mice. Secondly, if I do, maybe someone's going to call me a complainer. Maybe they're going to say I'm, I'm being dramatic or an alarmist. Maybe they're going to say I'm too sensitive particularly as a man growing up in Australia. That's something I didn't hear very often, but once from my mother when I shared something quite vulnerable, she said, David, you're being too sensitive. Oh, and I was very sensitive about that, I'll tell you. So one thing we can do, let's suppose there's something I want to share. Um, it, it's at work, and I think that the company's got the wrong strategy. I think it's going to hurt the company. And I'm concerned about bringing it up in a meeting because maybe they're going to think I'm not a team player. Maybe they're going to think I'm an alarmist, right? That's another mouse that's just popped up into the room. My first mouse is I think this is the wrong thing and I think, I, you know, maybe I want to say something about it. Then a new mouse creeps in. Oh, if I say this, they're going to think I'm an alarmist or they think I'm not a team player. So here's how I might address that is I might name both of those mice. Hey, I notice um, I have a concern about the direction that we're heading in and I want to make a contribution because I think this could really help the company and it impacts all of us. So I'm sharing a positive intention. I'm not just saying, hey, that's stupid, right? I'm like, Shane, I want to help the company and I want to check, is this a good time for me to bring it up? Do, do you want dissenting viewpoints or do you just want me to get on board because I could do that too. So I'm, I'm, and and the reason I'm hesitant to bring it up is you might think I'm not a team player and I, I don't feel that way. So I'm naming these mice so people can understand more about where I'm coming from and not just think, boy, what a jerk who's, who's not getting on board. I'm sharing context. I'm sharing the extra mice that I have so people know I'm coming from a good place. And I'm in this moment, in this role play, I actually feel open to someone saying, no, I think we are beyond it. I really need, need everybody to get on board now. Okay, now I know this is what's wanted right now, but I got to find out. Well, as you're saying that, I start, I start thinking about, whoa, there's a lot of skill and behavior modification that, that goes into all of this. And, and needless yep. to say, as far as starting points are concerned, you know, because of like you were talking about, you know, our, our past and our upbringing and the environment, you know, that we were heavily influenced by all of that, you know, kind of puts us into where is our starting point, you know, meaning that, hey, I've, I've never even thought anything about this. And I just, I just kind of go with it, whichever that my default mechanisms are, you know, versus them needing to be, you know, systems and, and practices and, um, you know, skills that I need to develop, I mean, how, you know, how do I, I mean, to me, there's almost like a, a self-identification uh, and assessment that needs to take place, you know, as well yeah. as the ongoing coaching uh, so that I modify my behavior and, and say and do the right things at the right time. Agreed. Uh, and, you know, before when you asked me, so I want to name a mouse now, when, when you asked me about 
how how do you become aware of your mice i wasn't happy with my answer and the reason is it's really hard to to read the label from inside the jar we can't see ourselves another metaphor i heard recently is when you're in a battle you got no perspective all you see is like what's right in front of you you can't see the whole battle and this is coming we're getting outflanked over here so the best answer that I have is work with a coach or a therapist, someone outside you who's going to see stuff and is going to help you work out what your mice are. It'll help you work out what's what's going on. Now, I've been at it so long and I have so many. Uh, so it's one point last year I had five coaches and uh, when I'm not working with coaches, I've got friends who are coaches and I can like, like what's going on here? I'm upset but I don't really understand why I'm upset and I want to get clear about what my truth is, what I'm unhappy about, what my request is. Like that, often we really need help. I need help and I've been at this for 20, 30 years. I'll give you an example of one that, that did pop up for me and I needed help with. I have a housemate and um, I've been, I'm very sensitive about noise and now he already knows that. Right? He already knows that I'm sensitive about noise. And then one day I said to him, so what do you got going on tonight? He said, I got some friends coming over, um, but you know, don't, don't worry, we'll be quiet. And I was like, all right, thanks. But I didn't, you know, we have an agreement that after 10 o'clock is, is, is special quiet time. And I was wondering, how late is he going to go? Like, even if he's trying to be quiet and it's 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, you can't stop people laughing. Right, like it's really hard, and I noticed it was still sitting with me after the conversation. I was like, that wasn't quite clear, and so I was worried about bringing it up because I do feel neurotic. I am neurotic. I am oversensitive, and I'm worried he's going to be like, "Oh, you're being oversensitive." If I'm being quiet, it's none of your business how late they stay. Right, that's what I'm worried about. And finally, I decided to take a risk and to name that mouse with him and i was going to text him and i'm like text is a bad way to do this it's just you know, like who knows what's going to come up so the next level is i could do an audio or i could even do a video pro tip videos are way better than text because they can see your energy they can feel your energy but even that i'm like i really just need two minutes with him face to face so i said can i have two minutes face to face i'll meet you out on the deck uh it won't take long and he's like, yeah, all right. He walks out on the deck. And I said to him, this is edgy for me, right? That's a mouse. Boom. This is edgy for me to, to share this because I feel very neurotic. Um, and it's going to take me about two minutes to, to share what's going on for me. Can you give me two minutes? And um, I think the reason is I want you to understand me better. All right, so I gave him a reason. And you're right, there is an art to it, and that's what we cover in the book, some steps so that it goes easier. You can, uh, you can imagine if I didn't set up that context and I just said, hey, um, I really want everyone out by 10 o'clock, that might not go very well. So I set up this context and then I said, look, I've realized my truth, and it took me a while to get clear on this. My great preference is that there are no people in the house after 10 o'clock because even if you're trying to be quiet, I just still stay on alert, so it's hard for me. However, it's Saturday night. If it feels important to you to have that extra hour with people in the house, just let me know as soon as possible. I'll go for a walk. I'll go to a friend's house. I'll get out of the house. I'll deal with it. Just let me know. And he said, all right, well, I'll aim to have everybody out of the house by 10 o'clock, and if it's going to go later, I'll tell you. Now, Jim, the great benefit of that for me is I got to be self-expressed. I got to give him all the data points so he has all the information. Now he can choose what he wants to do with it, and I was at peace. If he decides to go till 11, I know it was important to him, and I really am happy to get out of the house for that. There's communication, we're in sync, as it turned out. He, he had everyone gone by like nine o'clock, I think they went to another friend's house. And I was so grateful, I'm like, ah, oh, that's wonderful. So back to the question, working with a coach, working with a therapist is the best way. If you don't wanna do that, get the book. If the full book isn't out yet, um, we've still got the mini book. 
that you can read and it'll give you a really great start to to mouse naming. Um, so yeah, there's my long answer to the question. Coach or therapist is the best way, but reading the book will help you as well. And you've still got this tip that I gave you. If you're not enjoying the interaction, there's your clue. Okay, wait a minute. What is happening for me? What are my mice? What's going on? You may not be able to work it out right there and then in the interaction with someone. That's pretty advanced. I sometimes say, oh, wait a minute. Something, well, this is what I aspire to actually. I don't often say this, but I want to. Can we slow it down a bit? Give me a minute. I want to work out what's happening. Something's going on and I, want to, I don't want to fumble with my words. That's a pro tip. But if that doesn't happen, you might work it out later on. You sit down, you journal, you talk with people about it, and you say, hey, can I, can I talk to you again about this? I didn't realize what was going on at the time. Now I have more information. I want to share it with you so we have a great working relationship or because I want to feel more connected with you or whatever it is. That's a great way to set up mouse naming. You know, as you're talking, I'm starting to think about the pressures that we have in our society. And, and for, for us, you know, we always talk about how all of this can impact the customer experience, right? And then I start thinking about all those interactions that we have with customers. I don't have time to set down those foundational elements. I don't have time, you know, to pause and to break. I don't, you know, we're in a fast paced world. I mean, in order for us to have our lives and our organizations move forward faster, I mean, you, to me, as you're talking, I'm like, well, this is going to take forever. I ain't got time for that. Right. So for me, it's like, ha, ha, ha. move on. Oh, my goodness. You, so you're my new favorite podcast host for asking that question, Jim. So question is, who's got time to do all this mouse naming? I got, I got things to do. I got money to make. I got, I got clients to serve. Well, here's the thing. Not naming our mice is horrendously expensive. If I've got an issue with a client and I'm not naming my mice, I'm not sharing those issues and I'm not resolving them, I don't want to talk to that client. I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding that client because because maybe I see them as a pain in the ass. Maybe they've got, uh, they're doing things that don't work for me. I just had a client uh, miss a session. No notice. Now that doesn't work for me, right? If I don't address that, that's a big mouse for me. Might not be what for them. They're like, hey, I just, you know, I had a family thing. I had a family thing come up. Hey, I'm fine with a family thing coming up. But it's very rare that something comes up that is so critical and so urgent, you can't take five seconds to send a text. Right? So I want to have that conversation with the client so that it's not going to happen again. If I don't name that mouse, maybe in two weeks, she misses another session. Right? And now I've got real issues with, with, with that client. So when we think, oh, I don't have time to, to mouse name with my kids. Really? You don't, you know, you don't want deeper connection with your kids? That's going to bite you in the butt at some point. Absolutely. What about with your partner? I don't have time to go and name that when she said something yesterday, I felt a bit insulted. I don't have time for that. Well, those, that mouse is going to breed with other, other mice. And then something else happens with my partner. And I'm like, oh, it's not worth rocking the boat. I'm not going to bring it up. And then now I got another mouse. And then eventually I'm going to blow up. I'm going to get really angry about some small thing that my partner did because I didn't name mice. So, oh, perfect example for me right now. I don't want to invest more time. I don't want to go and have a house meeting with my roommate. It's, it could be awkward. He could get angry about stuff. I don't want to have that house meeting. But I do know if I don't name my mice and if he doesn't have a chance to name his mice, it's going to cost me. Someone I'm living with, it's going to cost me big time. So I've actually made time four times in the three months we've been living together to go and have half an hour to 45 minutes to talk about our mice. Because I know if I don't do it, something's going to happen. 
he'll get angry with me about something and I'm not going to get what I want in the house. So it's so worth the investment in people and our relationships. If all you do is be, be transactional day in, day out, and by transactional, I mean I'm just being practical. I'm trying to get something done. If that's all you do, people will not want to work with you. Customers will not want to be around you. Your staff eventually are going to leave for someone else. Your partner's not going to be happy if you have one. And your kids are going to be like, where's dad or where's mom? And on your deathbed, you are not going to say, thank God. I got all that stuff done and I skipped all those tedious mouse naming relational moments. You are not going to say that. Well, as you're talking, I start thinking about there are certain relationships where I may have the time to do that. But if I think about, you know, a customer service type of scenario, it is very transactional. And I, but yet I do, because oftentimes those are, you know, conflict types of interactions. They're not just you know, simple serving types of interactions. I still need to learn these skills so that maybe, you know, me, I'm aware, even though that my cohort, you know, isn't so that we can have a more positive outcome. So if I'm thinking about it from that perspective, I don't have time to say, you know, and, and go through the whole identification process and, and all of that. So how can I take some of these skills and apply them in a more transactional you know, interaction, because also, too, if you look at it, that's how most of our interactions throughout the day actually yeah. occur. They're transactional. Yeah. Well, yeah. A friend said to me once, David, you can you can come across as very transactional. I didn't know what it meant. I said, as opposed to what? And he said, as opposed to relational. And that's when I realized this is the water I swim in. Transactional. I'm very left-brained. I'm very, you know, in time and space, like, let's make things happen. So, um, but we can blend the two. So if there's something transactional, let's suppose I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to get you to do better work. Maybe I'm trying to get you to, uh, you work for me and I'm trying to get you to show up on time to meetings. That's transactional. But we can have more influence in the transaction if, I'm, if I name my mice, which actually becomes relational because now I'm letting you know what's going on for me. Let's do any, let's, you know, here are some words that might come to me if, if you've been late to meetings. Hey, can I talk to you about something uh, that I think is going to improve our meetings? You got a, have you got a minute? So I'm getting consent. That's relational right? And it's going to serve the transaction. Okay. And suppose you say yes. All right. Uh, I've noticed, you know, the last two meetings, you've, you've been a few minutes late. Does that sound right? Do I have that right? So I'm just checking. We got the facts, right? And uh, okay, great. So when that happens, I start worrying that other people are going to start being late to the meetings, right? One person's late, it's not addressed. And, and I don't want that. Then, then, um, the meetings are going to take longer. And also I feel disempowered. So my request is, and notice I'm sharing my feelings. I'm actually saying, you know, I feel disempowered. And my request is that, that you arrive three minutes early to all of our Zoom meetings uh, to make sure that you're on time. Let's say for the next month. And, uh, and think that in that way, um, I'd feel really motivated. I'd feel more motivated for these meetings. What do you say? And then you can share what's going on for you. I really want to know. Maybe you feel, you know, I might even say, how is it for you to hear that? That's a pro tip. No one says that. How is it for you to hear that? Is it, is it you know, do you feel um, annoyed? embarrassed, defensive, inspired, or something else. I often throw out a menu. And then we can talk about it. You might say, well, I'm a little bit embarrassed, you know, but I do want to say some other people have been late. Absolutely. They have been late. I'm going to talk with them as well. In fact, I might bring it up at the meeting. 
and say, we'll talk about it as a group and see what do we want to do. Do we want a meeting that we arrive 10 to 15 minutes late to? Is that what we want? Or do we want a meeting where everyone shows up, ready to go, boom, and we end on time? So it's transactional. I want to influence you, and I'm doing it by naming my mice. So Here's a big leadership mistake. Don't share your why with people. Tell them, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try out this new meeting technique, uh, and we'll see how it goes, see if it improves things. But you don't share the why. Hey, I spend a lot of time um, thinking about meetings. I'm a geek. And I think about how it can be better and how we can be motivated and how we can leave each meeting going, whoa, damn, that was fun. And we got a lot done. Like that's where I'm coming from. And so I've got an idea that might make meetings better and I want us to try it. Here's the meeting. What do you say? Who's with me? That's leadership. Okay. So wait a minute. Wait. You're saying, unlike Simon Sinek, who's made it all famous, you're saying don't share your why. No, I'm saying share your why. Share your why. Okay. I thought, yeah. I thought I'm I saying it's a big mistake I got it. to not share your why. And look, this could be with your kids as well. How tempting would it be as a parent? Um, I, I'm not a parent. I've been a kid. But how tempting to say, look, because I said. And sometimes you'll have to do that. You're out in public. There isn't a lot of time. Maybe there's a safety issue. So, hey, sometimes it'll be because I said, but if you're willing to take the time, now we get back to like, I'm, I'm time scarce, right? But if you're willing to take the time and say, let me tell you why I want you to not use those, those swear words um, with your friends and with other people. I'm worried that they will think badly of you. I'm worried they'll think, oh, that kid wasn't raised well. That kid's not someone I want my kid to be around. I'm worried they won't invite you to parties. I'm worried that you'll get worse grades. I'm worried that if you continue this into adulthood, that you, you'll miss out on getting a job you really want to have. These are the things I worry about as a parent. And that's why I would like you to not use those words at home or out, even though you might hear me do it. Right? Okay. And so now that, I just made that up. Oh, no, I know you made it up, but as you're saying that, I start saying, okay, then um, I'm, I'm projecting the response is going to be, I don't care. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, you may get that. You may get that from your kid, from your coworker, from your boss. I, I don't care about that. So I'd probably look for something that they did care about. I imagine a lot of kids would want to get invited to parties. Definitely. That, I imagine they want that. But yeah, they may not care. And so um, maybe that didn't work and I come back to. And so um, there is going to be a punishment if you do it. Not because I'm angry at you. I love you. And, and I, I think this is good for you. So if you do use those words at home, this is what's going to happen. I hear you. Okay. So man, gosh, this is not easy work by any stretch of the imagination. And, no. and I would dare to say, and you kind of alluded this to a moment ago, is that this is lifelong work uh, because some of us have gone through some hard wiring and, and we have to continually be on top of these things in order to make sure that we're successful. One of the things that we need in order to help inspire us on the show that we focus in on our quotes. Is there a quote or two that you like that you can share? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to quote Byron Katie, and I'm going to quote something that I said because I really like it. I like how it came out. Uh, Kate, Byron Katie says, the worst thing that can happen to you is a thought. And I absolutely believe that now. That is the worst thing. It's not what happens to us in life. Totaling the car losing our job, uh, losing a leg, being diagnosed with a terminal illness, or losing a loved one. That's not the suffering. Suffering doesn't come from any of that. The suffering comes from what we're believing about it. And so whenever, whenever I am unhappy and I'm not enjoying the situation, I might, come, I might ask myself, what are my mice here? What's going on? I'll also ask myself, what am I believing? 
when I'm really upset and struggling, which I have been the last two weeks over some anxiety stuff, what am I believing that's causing the anxiety? So that's one quote. And the other thing is something I said once, the tough conversations we haven't had, and we could, we could translate that to the, the mice we haven't named, form the boundaries of our world. Those are the boundaries of our world. As we go and name our mice, then the boundaries of our world get pushed back further and further and further. We just keep on expanding. Well, when I start thinking about this work that you're doing and uh, what you're still yet to do, I'm sure you have some goals in front of you. Uh, so if you could share with us one of your key goals. I love that question. My face is lit up right now. Um, one of my key goals is to do a do a great job in this play that I just got a, a role in. So uh, playing Dracula and I just I want to lose myself in that character and really enjoy myself, have it be a very emotional Dracula, which is what the director wants. Um, my deeper goal is to have more and more access to my emotions. I want to be able to bring on anger when I want to access anger. I want to be able to cry on cue. I want to be able to access these emotions and embody these characters. So that's a goal I'm, I'm working on. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. All Thank right. you, Jim. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the home day hoedown. Okay, David, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. And I'm going to ask you several questions. And your job is to give us robust yet rep responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. David Wood, are you ready to hoe down? I'm ready, Jim. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? I think my thoughts. My thoughts about uh, your noise sensitivity and my thoughts about, uh, you know, just needing things to be so quiet it causes some angst in my system. And um, I think that's slowing me down. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? It's okay to be you. In fact, people want that. And what is one of your best tools that you believe helps you in business or life? The work by Byron Katie, which is a simple process to investigate any thought that's causing pain. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? And it could be from any genre. Maybe that was it. Um, or you can add another. You know, I'm going to go out there. Um, got nothing to do with business. It's just I've read it three times. I'm going to read it a fourth uh, I've listened to the audio book five times. It's called The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. And it's a fantasy book. And uh, I, ju I just think it's absolute genius. So if you're into fantasy or magic at all, you must go and read The Name of the Wind. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net and doing a search for David Wood. Okay, David, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you've been given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25. You could take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only take one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I would take back the knowledge that my nervous system is very sensitive and that there are ways to learn how to calm it down and ground. And I would have learned that way earlier. At the age of 25 would be a great time to really get good at that skill. I don't know how I would convince myself if I went back in time and said, you've got to learn this, this will change your life. But uh, that's one thing that I could have used then, and I'm still working on it now to just, I, this is what I got from my therapist yesterday, which was brilliant. To paraphrase him, he said, you can't think your way out of everything. Sometimes you need to disengage your mind from the content and use physiological things to ground your body and calm down. And I, that was exactly what I needed to hear. So I go back 
tell that 25 year old self. David, I had fun with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jim. Well, I created a link uh, um, for listeners that'll take you to a hidden page on my website with a gift basket of goodies. So there's a there's a checklist on how to achieve twice as much in half the time. There's a link to name that mouse so you can get the mini book right now. And if you want to see if coaching with me would be a fit for us, there's a, a way that you can get on a phone call with me and we'll see uh, what we might do together and if it has legs. And you can do all of these things. Uh, oh, plus listen to my podcast, Extraordinary Focus with David Wood. And you can get all those things at myfocusgift.com because I want to give you the gift of focus. So what better link than myfocusgift.com? Take you straight there. David Wood, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and helping us all get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 